Thanks, everyone. Uh, I'm Sherard Griffin. I am a senior manager at Red Hat, and I work in the AI Center of Excellence, where we work on Open Data Hub. And I'll explain a little bit more about what Open Data Hub is in a second here. Yeah. All right. We're good to go. Before I dive into this, uh, Dan did an excellent job talking about what it means from an ethical standpoint to do AI, what it means in terms of what we have to think about, how we make it into a practical application. Uh, I'm actually going to take it one step farther and, and dive a little bit more into the technical part of this. How can you get started? How can you, your customers get started with your AI initiatives? And we're going to round that out with something called Open Data Hub. I'm actually going to start with this with a little bit of background of how we got the name Data Hub. We started this project internally at Red Hat, and the focus was more specifically around aggregating data. That was the primary reason I came to Red Hat, is because of the experience dealing with big data. And we knew we wanted to do that on OpenShift and show the capabilities of OpenShift as a platform for data engineering and ingestion. We had the data lake. All of a sudden, one of my colleagues, Marcel, who heads up the AI ops team, said, hey, Sherard, we have all this data. I want to do some data science work on it. What can, where can I point my data scientist? And I say, huh? You know, yeah, we've got all these tools for data ingestion. No, no, no. I want to do it more of an AI type of thing. So what we decided to do was figure out how to bake AI into what we were doing on top of OpenShift. And that's how we got the Open Data Hub. And really, the problem that we tried to solve was how can a data scientist, instead of bugging everyone on my team every time they want to do something, how can we enable them to have more of a self-service type of infrastructure? How can they just go into an environment, request the resources and the, and the technologies that they want, have that working in a collective ecosystem, and then get, in, get on with their initiatives and be able to get some results out of it? So if you look at that whole self-service model, that's one of the big drivers of Open Data Hub, is how do we enable the data scientists to do what they need to do in a flexible manner? It's what we found internally was needed. So that, again, I don't get a bunch of ServiceNow tickets and requests for, in, uh, for onboarding. But then we also talk to a lot of customers. We've had a little bit of a roadshow over the past year where we've talked to many, many different customers, and it turns out that they're interested in the same thing. Some of the current challenges that the data scientists, both internally at Red Hat and at our customers, were facing, one of the big things is that they were all working in their own isolated, one-off environments, whether that's a laptop or a server housed away somewhere, tucked underneath uh, one of their desks. It's very challenging for them to, number one, have a way to be able to share their work together, right? be able to take some kind of model that they built and say, hey, this is really cool. It does something tangible. Why don't you go check it out? Two, one of the biggest things is just limited resources. If you imagine the environment where, let's say you do have that machine tucked under your desk, uh, what happens if you need more hardware? You have to bubble that up the chain. Even if you have traditional IT infrastructure, what happens if you need more hardware? You have to, sub you have to send in a, a request to IT. IT then has to order the hardware. The hardware takes a few weeks to come in. Next thing you know, you spun it up, and you know, you're, you're off to the races. But oh, by the way, it took you three months. So what we're trying to do is figure out ways to address those challenges to not only lift the burden for IT, but also make it a little bit more flexible for data scientists. What we gravitated towards was OpenShift helping to solve that problem. And when you look at what we're trying to do, it's not that different than what you would see in an application lifecycle. You want to be able to have some kind of self-service environment. And in this case, we're replacing the term developers with data scientists. And you want to be able to have them do all the work that they need to do and push something out into production. So when we look at why OpenShift was so key and so relevant for us to build this platform on top of, the, one thing, the number one thing that stood out is the fact that it allows us to have such an easy mechanism to be able to deploy something into production. It's very similar for what an application developer would do. You have these iterations of testing something, and you want to push that out. The other thing it allows us to do is be able to load balance these services and be able to kind of, you know, you, you, you span out horizontally, but you can also span out vertically very easily, especially if you integrate Open so, uh, OpenShift along with something like OpenStack. So what that allowed us to do is every time a data scientist deploys a model, that model is a microservice. And then we scale it out depending on the demand. And I'll show you an example of that shortly. We also have the ability to orchestrate these microservices, these, these you know, machine learning microservices. 
and be able to you know, schedule them for training, deploy the model as a service, do whatever we need to do there, and not only deploy it in one environment, but we actually, real world problem we have today in Red Hat, we have some of the teams who have infrastructure in Amazon, and then we have some of the teams who have infrastructure on-prem. How do we do that same level of workload and, dis and shift all of that work to whatever resources we want to pretty freely uh, without ha with using the same infrastructure? And that's you know, the whole hybrid cloud solution that OpenShift gives us. And we just show the capabilities of doing that from a machine learning perspective. Where is AI strong right now? If you look at a lot of the customers that we're working with, they're, they're starting to do their AI initiatives. This is not a proof of concept. This is not something that's way out in the ephemeral cloud and, and everyone's talking about it, but no one's doing it. We actually have real tangible results that are being generated using OpenShift and using uh, a lot of Red Hat products and open source products in order to do, in order to do those things. So there are a couple that are interesting right here. We have Exxon Mobil. They'll, they'll talk about some of their use cases today. And it's, it's growing. It's a growing list. And not only that, we're using it internally at Red Hat as well. We generate about, uh, you know, about 300 gigabytes of data per day that flows through OpenShift that's available uh, to our data scientists. That's just from our build systems. We also have a massive amount of telemetry data that's being generated and that we're doing AI work on uh, on a daily basis. So the data volumes are growing, and the data scientists are, being, are having more and more capabilities in order to do their workloads. That all leads me to the Open Data Hub project. I mentioned a lot about the experiences that data scientists are looking for, the experiences that IT is looking for. How does that all get rounded out? What we decided to do is take all of those lessons learned from running an internal AI as a service platform at Red Hat and surface that up as an open source project. Where we have the Open Data Hub, it takes all of those little things that we worried about, not just the machine learning aspect of it, but what comes before that and what comes after. So you'll see a lot of focus in the Open Data Hub, I mentioned this at the beginning, about data ingestion and collecting data and how you build a data lake, whether that's a virtual or uh, an actual data lake uh, across a cl uh, many different clouds. Then we fo focus on how do you prepare and massage that data. You do things like cleaning it. You know, if anyone ever tells you, hey, the very first time I ingested data and it was perfectly ready for a, a machine learning exercise, you should probably not get that person on the project again. You know, there's always some work that has to be done from a preparation perspective. And then you're, you're all familiar with the machine learning, uh, building a model, training it, uh, pushing it out to production. But then once you push it out to production, your data scientists can't say, hey, oh, cool, I'm done. I can go home now. No. There's a lot, work, there's a lot of work that happens after it goes into production. How do, you model, how do you monitor it for drift? How do you make sure that that model is continuing to be accurate over time? Uh, just as if you were doing something with application development and you push some code out, you want to make sure that it's actually functioning over time. Uh, and, and it's a little bit of a joint operation between the data scientists and the SREs. And we'll show a little bit of that as well. If you're interested in the Open Data Hub uh, project, t-shirts out front, uh, I think they're pretty cool. Um, the funny story about the t-shirts, I realized that we've been handing these t-shirts out for about a year and a half now, and like no one on my team has ever gotten the t-shirts, so I got to stuff my suitcase full of t-shirts on the way back uh, just to make sure everyone has some. Uh, the, it, it is a blueprint architecture, so if you look online, you will be able to see a little bit more detail in terms of how to get started but then also uh, you know, what the whole vision of the Open Data Hub is and then how you can get involved. When we talk about Open Data Hub, I'll show you a little bit about the components that are in there, but I want to set the level, uh, you know, level set in terms of what is actually the vision of Open Data Hub and where we're pulling from. It's not just a collection of technologies that are kind of one-off. We're actually trying to tie ourselves to upstream communities. And the relevance for that is as the communities grow, then we, may, we enable these AI workloads on OpenShift and those capabilities will grow, grow as well. So we do a lot of partnership with NVIDIA. We, we have several components that are part of Kubeflow and we're having stronger integration with Kubeflow and Open Data Hub. Uh, we have some things with Selden. You know, PyTorch, Spark, a lot of open source technologies. We're kind of pulling from those communities and wrapping it all into a nice package that can be delivered on OpenShift. 
Now, let's get into the, the meats, the, the meat and potatoes. I'm a meat and potatoes kind of guy. So with this, what I'm going to show here is just a little bit of what's deployed when you actually go into Open Data Hub. We have a number of different things that are relevant for both the, uh, the data engineering side of it and the data science and machine learning side. We have for data science work, you have Jupyter Notebooks. You have uh, Ceph for your data lake. Uh, for ingesting data, you have Kafka. In this case, we use Strimzy, which is an operator. We also have Argo, which is great for your pipelines. And then we also have, from a monitoring perspective, Prometheus, Prometheus and Grafana. We have Selden for model serving, and then we have Spark. This is just what's available today in Open Data Hub. Uh, internally, we run a lot, uh, a much broader stack. Don't worry about the details of this diagram. You can go to the website and get more information. But this gives you a little bit more insight in terms of what's running internally at Red Hat and what's being POC'd out to move back up to the Open Data Hub. One of the things that we do is uh, we do a lot of processing data as it flows through Kafka. So we do things with Kafka Connect. We do things with KSQL uh, and Kafka consumers and producers. We also have Logstash, FluentD, RSYS log for, for data ingestion. Um, we, all, we build a data lake. We just happen to do our data lake in Ceph, but there's also S3, you know, any other technologies you want to do for your data lake. And then from a, you know, from, if you look all the way at the top, uh, from an analytics uh, perspective, we do a lot of analysis with Hue, which is Cloudera Hue, and then we have Kibana as well. And then for the model lifecycle, we have Kubeflow, MLflow, Selden. We also have something called the AI library. AI library is a predefined set of, uh, of um, ma machine learning models that you can get up and running really quickly. And those have been built with a kind of community efforts. So you have things like sentiment analysis, uh, cluster detection, uh, you know, all kinds of interesting things that you can have right out of the gate. And then for our business intelligence perspective, we're rolling out Superset pretty soon. Now, going really quickly, right before I get to the demo here, I just want to you know, kind of go back to what we'd said before. We're moving from a world where data scientists are on their own machines, or they have some, some isolated environment that they're doing their work. And what OpenShift allow, allows us to do is to move them to more of a, a centralized place to do all that work. Not only can they share the resources, they can share their models, their notebooks, uh, but then also it just makes it a nice place where you can actually push that model out into production as a service, and then that service itself can be managed and monitored just as if it's any other application uh, in, open, uh, in OpenShift. So with that said, I'm going to roll this demo. This is going to be interesting because all of my links to the demos on the other machine. So I'm going to try and do this from this machine, and we'll see how this goes. All right, Diane, I'm going to pull this up here. No, we don't need the VPN. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to log in here. And one of the first things I'm going to show you, if you want to get started with Open Data Hub, very, again, very easy to do. What you would do is uh, we're going to go into this uh, thing called Operator Hub. And, uh, just show of hands, how many people have actually played around with OpenShift 4? OK, so a, a good amount of folks. Um, I'll, I'll take a little bit of a step back and explain uh, Operator Hub. We're moving into the world of operators. You'll hear this a lot. Diane mentioned it earlier. Uh, operator Hub allows us to build out these operators that are really intelligent uh, you know, ways of managing infrastructure and managing your applications. And uh, we've released Open Data Hub as an operator. It's basically, you can think of it as a meta operator where it's responsible for other operators like Spark Operator, Strimzy, Kafka, uh, Selden. So it, you know, in this case, if you want to get started, instead of looking for all those individual applications that you want to install, you can just go in here and go to uh, and, and type in Open Data Hub. And then you'll see this Open Data Hub operator. If I click on this Open Data Hub operator, I then have the ability to install it. And if I'm installing it, then uh, that'll allow anyone who has a project in, in, in OpenShift to be able to deploy their own version of Open Data Hub. 
Now, for the sake of time, I've already done that, and I'm going to zoom this in a little bit in case that's a little hard to read back there. And I actually have a project already ready to go. And if we look really quickly, I just want to show exactly what gets deployed in Open Data Hub. And again, this is just kind of uh, the options that I've selected. You can choose different things to, to deploy, uh, whether you want all of it or just a couple of things. You can, you know, it's, at, it's at your will. But I mentioned this before. We have Grafana. We have Spark Operator. We have Strimzy Operator. Uh, and you know, we have a couple of other things that are deployed here, Jupyter Notebooks. Um, you know, some, and then what, the example that I'm going to work through today is actually a spam filter where you're trying to detect legitimate messages from fake messages. Now, what I'm going to do here, now that you see what's actually set up, I'm going to open up Jupyter Hub here. And I'm going to log in. And before I do that, I want to show you one more thing here, one of the capabilities that we've added into Jupyter Hub. So I'm going to log in as a into an environment here. And I'll show you uh, some of the interesting things you can do with Jupyter Hub here. When, you first, when your data scientist first goes into Jupyter Hub, they have the ability to select these notebook images. In this case, we have several different images. And the image allows us to kind of prepackage up uh, some resources that we want available to the data scientist right out the gate. In this case, what you'll see is uh, Spark along with SciPy. But you can do anything like TensorFlow, whatever other types of technologies you want to add there. Uh, they, they have that ability to just kind of select and choose. This is, you, we have some predefined ones that you have out of the box, but of course it's a community. If there are others that you want to add, you can always contribute it. Or if you have something private that you want to roll internally, you can do that as well. They can also select the size of the cluster that they want here. So anything small, medium, large. And in this case, this is specifically for the container running the Jupyter Notebooks. The other thing that happens here, I'm not going to show an example here, but you can play around with it on Open Data Hub, is when I select that I want a Spark cluster, behind the scenes, when I start my notebook server, you'll actually see a Spark cluster spin up specifically for that data scientist. And that can be whatever size that, that you want, um, you know, anything from just a couple of workers to 10, 15 workers, whatever you need for your, for your work. And then the cool thing is once you terminate that notebook and say, hey, I'm done with today's work, the Spark cluster cleans up automatically for you, and it goes back into the OpenShift uh, ethereal of, of uh, hardware available. Also, what you can do here is decide how many GPUs you want to use, and the workloads will actually be run on that GPU. So if you have GPUs enabled in OpenShift, it's as simple as changing this number to whatever you want, and you have the ability to do that. Uh, some of the other options here uh, I won't really explain, but if you're interested in about, it, about them, you can always take a look online. So I've already started a, a notebook server for you uh, for, for this demo. And what I'm going to do is walk through a couple of things here. Uh, the first thing I'm going to show you is uh, we have this feature engineering workbook. This feature engineering workbook, uh, it's really about preparing the data and making sure that we have training data ready to go for the model. In this case, you know, what, I'm, what you'll see here is it's all this fancy data, I'm not a data scientist, so I had a data scientist create this. It makes me look smarter than I am. Uh, but all I, all, he told me this. When you look at the graph, all we really need to know is blue is legitimate messages, orange is spam. You want to see that those diverge so that you're correctly associating legitimate messages with spam messages. And so we're good to go. We know that we have a good training data set uh, that we can use. And now let's move on to the training aspect of it. So I'm going to go back and select the notebook to train my model. Now, once I have this notebook for training my model, you'll see here that I'm going to just quickly, and let me zoom in a little bit here for you guys. What I'll show you here is all we're really doing is deciding what is a legitimate message and what's a, what's a, uh, a spam message. And in this case, 
dark blue is great. You know, this lighter color is great as well. That means, again, the messages have diverged, and we can clearly tell what a legitimate message is from a spam message. Awesome. We're good to go. Uh, and then what I want to do here is let's, let's play around with this a little bit. Let's actually um, uh, see if we can uh, get a, just a little bit more information about what's going on. So in this case, I can see that I've got, uh, I predicted that this, th these messages were le legitimate and the actual result was legitimate. I have a pretty good accuracy of 94%. I have some that were predicted legitimate but were actually spam. That's only, you know, that's only about 5%. I have some that were spam that, I were detect that uh, was actually uh, legitimate but they were de we thought they were spam. And that's about 2%. And then the ones that were spam that actually were spam is 97%. So I'm good, right? I'm happy with those results. Again, it's not perfect, like Dan said, but it's good enough to, to start with. And then I'm going to just run this next one here and show, again, the accuracies. You know, everything looks pretty good. So now, now that I have that, what I want to do is start to deploy this as a service. And as I deploy it as a service, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run through all of these cells really quickly. It doesn't take long. And we'll see some results start to come out here. So, uh, and, and one of the things I actually want to show you is how I deployed it as a service. So I want to take a step back here and go into my build configs and have something called pipeline. And in pipeline, what I've actually done is I've taken the model itself, so this model notebook, and you'll see, you'll see this is the actual model notebook that we have here. Uh, we have something called source to image, but we built source to image to work on notebooks. If your data scientist has a notebook and they want to deploy it as a model, uh, as a service, then they can quickly run source to image on this just as if it were an application and deploy it uh, into OpenShift as a running notebook. And you'll see here, you know, we have that actually running here. Uh, if I can show you which pod. Uh, the spam filter pod. And we can, again, scan, scale that guy up and down however we want, right? You know, we can scale it up to 10 different ones. So with that said, we'll look back at the service notebook. And then we just ran a quick test. Now that it's up and running, all I, all I want to do is send it a, a, note of, uh, a message. And I'm sending it a message through REST. I'm saying, hey, I'm going to send you something dog food. Dog food is detected as spam. And then I'm going to send you the second message. And that second message was sent as legitimate. And great, everything looked good. Then I can keep going here. And I'm actually going to now predict a few more, few more messages here. And what you'll see is, again, all I'm doing is I'm sending a REST message to the service. And I'm getting some results back. You can see these were pretty good, right? It's, uh, it's pretty accurate again. So now that I have that, uh, a couple of things that I can do here. Open Data Hub also deploys with Prometheus. As a data scientist, I want to, I've tested this out. That's awesome. Now I want to actually see how is it performing over time. And that's always an interesting one because we always think about the deployment of it as, hey, it worked that first time. But we don't ever uh, think about how do I test this and validate this over time. So what I want to do here is I'm actually going to go back to, uh, back to the Prometheus. And I'll show here exactly what's happening over time. And let's see here if I can remember the metric. Hold on one second here. Oh, I'm, I'm not going to have time. It's on my machine, but uh, I'm not going to have time. What I would actually show you is uh, it's a really cool graph. I wish I could show you here. Let's see here. Uh, no, I won't be able to pull that up, unfortunately. It's on my machine, the, uh, the command for that. Um, but what I, what I'll, uh, what's cool is you'll actually see a graph of, of activity here. But one of the things I can show you is that if we look at the metrics itself here, there are tons and tons of metrics that come, uh, that come from what I actually have here. And what you'll see is these metrics like pipeline predictions created, total pipelines, the you know, the how many, basically just, you know, what's going through the system. So if I, if I click on one of these, let's say this guy, um, you'll actually start to see some activity. And here, it's not as cool of a chart as I wanted to show you, but this is how you can see right out of the gate, I've deployed something, it's a nice microservice, and it's actually giving some results, and these are actually changing over time. This is all coming through live, uh, and, and the data is flowing through. 
Uh, one more thing really quickly that I want to show is that we also have uh, Grafana that's hooked into this. And so when we go through Grafana, we can check out a number of other uh, metrics that come across. And in this case, what we have here is some Kafka metrics. And again, you'll see everything is flowing through. This is when I started the spam uh, detector this morning. And you see that some data is actually flowing through the system. So again, all of this with Open Data Hub, you have Prometheus, Grafana, Selden, all of these different technologies rolled into a nice deployable package for you. And we're going to continue to release more and more technologies to round out the, the whole ecosystem of the end-to-end -end AI pipeline for you. Um, and that's, that's really it. Uh, you know, it's the whole project. Uh, we're very excited about it. We're great to, to have it as a, a nice foundational piece of how you can do AI and ML on top of OpenShift. The, the landing page for, so people know how to find it. Oh, yes, I, yes, yes. You guys never remember to do that. Yes. So, of course, always go to opendatahub.io. That's where, and then there's a link to community if you want to know how to reach out to us, and then also docs if you want to know how to get started. Thank you, Diane. Cool. Yeah, there you go. Great. I'll Thank you. It.